opening record. Okay, you're good. Thank you. So we can officially, officially start. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're doing our second uh, webinar series in a group of five on OER at MTSU. And hopefully if you were able to come to the one last week during our, during our snow week, uh, it was a great introduction to OER. This is the second step, discover, discovering open educational resources and uh, adopting and adapting and creating. So if, once you've decided that OER is worth exploring and for you, how, how do you go about that? Um, and we are your host today, Kim Godwin, instructional designer, and I'm Suzanne Mangrum, an acquisitions librarian. We're part of the steering committee for an OER grant that we received from TBR in December of 2020. And the other members of our steering committee are Cheryl Tornsney, Erica Stone, I think Erica's here today, uh, Ryan Corsange and Bud Fisher, and Bud might be here today. Um, so a little about our grant, it's embracing equity through OER. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but there is a link uh, on the press release. And I also sent everyone a PDF of our slides uh, a few minutes ago. If I, if I had your name as of yesterday, as somebody who, who registered for this event, you should have gotten that email. If not, I can send it to you after this. Um, so you can read more about our grant there. We also have our website. It is still under construction. <laughs> we are building content. We should have this up very soon. So there will be more information soon, but there's not much there yet. And again, this is the second in our workshop series. Last week, uh, Erica Stone and Rai Corsange did a, a fabulous presentation on OER basics, uh, just basically what, what it is and why you should care. So um, the recording is now up on, on the LTNITC YouTube channel, so please Take a look at that if you haven't seen it already. Um, but I know some of you were there last week because I watched the recording and saw the great conversation. I heard the great conversation afterwards. Um, next week, or maybe the second week of March will be the, the third in the series, which is using OER in class, open pedagogy and what comes next. And that will be um, by Ryan Corstange and maybe some, other, some others as well. So stay tuned for an announcement about that. So today, we're going to talk about discovery, finding OER, um, and a little bit about how to review an OER for, review OER for quality, because that's always a big issue, and then the, the next steps. So how, how to go about adopting the adaptation process or creating or publishing your own OER if you don't find one, or have something you just wanna create or publish. Um, OER is, has existed for a long time, over 20 years. So it's a really great time to get into OER if you're new to this because um, it's grown to something that's more accepted and recognized and there's a, a core of really fantastic resources that are available for use. Um, some high quality resources, textbooks, all kinds of courseware that you could use. But today I'm gonna go through my favorites. Um, I have a, a treasure trove of, of sources that you can use at the end of this presentation, um, but we're going to go through my favorites. The Open Textbook Library, OER Commons, the George Mason MetaFinder, and then a product we have at Walker Library called Faculty Select. I'm going to try to go through these fairly quickly because I want to make sure that we have time for conversation at the end of this. Um, but I guess before you start looking at any of these, it kind of goes without saying, but you need to have your learning objectives firmly in mind as you would for any, any textbook um, search that you're going to do when you're trying to find something to use for your course. Um, and it also helps to, to just start with known repository and, and identify basic keywords and concepts that you, you want to use to find information. You're not going to find anything that maps syllabus exactly, but you need to, you know, break down elements and pieces that you want in your course and start searching for those. Um, and, and you can tell a lot, just like you could from any textbook from the table of contents 
and there are reviews and there are other rubrics that you can use to review. So let's start. Uh, the first one, Open Textbook Library uh, is a re repository managed by the Open Education Network and MTSU is now a member of this network. We joined last year. Um, one reason I like it is that it's for college courses and a lot of these sites or repositories are for K through 20. Um, and it has faculty reviews. If you go through the open network training, you can review textbooks. So when you're looking for things, you can see what other, other faculty are saying about, about this text. So this is the open textbook library homepage. And if I did a nice basic search, I did public speaking, if you do speech, you're gonna get all kinds of stuff, communication. But if I wanna do, you know, COM 2200, a, a basic course, my example throughout this is gonna be public speaking. Um, and with that search, I had about three relevant hits, but this is the top result, stand up, speak out. Um, and if you click on the title, which I've already done, you can, you can see what this book has to offer. And you can at first see the conditions of use, the Creative Commons license there, and we'll talk a little more about that later. Um, but that means anyone can have this book. And the formats that are available are in the orange squares. And you can also kind of peruse the table of contents to get an idea of what, if this will or will not work for your course objectives. But um, another reason I like this is that it has a review. So if I click on those reviews, I mean, there, there were 50, so here's one and two. But if you click on the read more, it, you can see it's a pretty comprehensive review. The open text work, textbook reviews include this criteria. So all of these things are going to be reviewed by each of the reviewers. So it, that is why I like this repository. It's, it's pretty comprehensive. It's what you would expect with a traditional review. Um, OpenStax, which we're not covering in the favorites, is definitely the gold standard. It has a traditional peer reviewed. It's probably, I think, the best known OER repository out there. And it's it's amazing, but it doesn't it doesn't maybe have as many books and as many subjects because they are so in depth and the review process is so thorough. Um, you can find those, you can find the OpenStack stuff in the Open Textbook Library. But I also I also like this because I think they they don't all have reviews, but most of them do. And most of most of the time this is a really quick comprehensive review that gives you an idea of, yeah, a lot of professors like me would use this. Sorry. But if you don't have that, and a lot of the repositories don't have these reviews built in. Um, you can find a review strategy that works for you. Here are some rubrics that are well known from other OER, other OER um, repository like BC Campus, and this is Affordable Learning Georgia. But uh, this is one created by Kim. The MTSU Online Evaluation Checklist can also give you just a very simple rubric that you can go through for accuracy, objectivity, you know, currency, all that stuff so that you could take this or keep something in mind for any resource they're gonna review in any OER repository. And of course, you know, you might already have one, your department might have one that you use, but here's a place to start. Okay, back to favorite resources. Um, this is the Mason OER Metafinder, Metafinder created by George Mason Libraries and there are so many OER resources available, and although I like a nice curated list, this resource is an admirable way to herd cats. Um, it's federated searching, so if when you search here, it's going to it's going to do your search in all of these repositories and resources. Um, it, it's it's very impressive, and it will just you know go pull out tons of results for you. Um, I would recommend, so here's my search, I did public speaking again, that you do not use the deeper search. You just take that out. Um, I find when I use it, I, I'm buried in um, government documents and Library of Congress records. 
And I would look at these, you know, it may be right for you. If you are looking for open resources to cover a narrow field, uh, you might want to consider the open access books options. But in general, and I'm doing a very general course, I, I wouldn't use it. So with my public speaking search this way, I got 580 results. Um, but I noticed that this date range picker is a nice way. If, if we librarians are super used to this, but this left menu to filter and sort your results, I like the date range picker. So I limited this to the last five years and that cut me down to 93 results. And some of these I've seen on other sites, but you know, there's a good place to start. There's a nice list for you to start um, finding resources. At this point, there will be a lot of compiling and um, a lot of reviewing that will need to happen. Um, there are books, articles, assignments, modules, not just textbooks. Um, some of the results are going to be too specific to be useful. Some of the results are going to be off topic, but a lot of the results are going to be worth looking at. At this point, you just have to start filtering through. Um, the last two I'm going to go over very quickly because we still want to have time to talk about uh, adopting and adapting and creating. But um, these are extreme, this one is extremely popular, and I think OER Commons and it's sort of a, a must go to resource, not just as a repository, but for a community hub. Um, it's, not, it's not my personal favorite because there are so many local copies of materials that I think I kind of get lost um, instead of having, you know, just primo textbooks right there. There's, there's a lot of everything, but that could be what you're looking for. Um, but there's undeniably some wonderful material here and it's not always listed in other places. So this is kind of a must stop resource. So for this search, it's super easy. There's the magnifying glass, which isn't showing here because it's being used, but you can put in your search term. I don't have a lot of luck with the, the subject fields, but you may like that. But I just like to limit it by, um, by the user, by the level, so lower division. And um, I came up with, I, I didn't show my search results there, but this is a simple, a simple search and it's definitely worth trying. Okay, oh yeah, and last of all, faculty select. This is a resource that is paid for by the library. Um, it, 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 searches OER, but it also searches for multi-user ebooks um, that and it searches for all of it at the same time. So if you did public public speaking, you'd get OER textbooks and also things you know written by Wiley and Taylor and Francis, maybe some nice handbooks. But this could be really useful for courses that are not general, that are more specific, that are higher level. Um, it includes BC Campus, the Open Textbook Library, and some others, uh, SUNY Open Textbook, which has now changed their names. But, and they also have um, ebook publishers from Wiley and Cambridge and Taylor and Francis. Those are completely um, free and digital rights management free, which we could talk about if, if needed. But there are also a lot of ebooks on there that are multi user but not digital rights management free. So your students might be limited on how many pages they could print off, but they're still multi-user. So this is a nice, a nice option. And I, I don't even have a picture of it, but there's a link there and I, I think it's worth checking out. So those are my favorite resources. And that kind of just gives you an idea of, of how you would start looking, looking, looking. Now that you, know you want to use an OER and you have some ideas, what are you going to do? So the first thing you have to consider are um, what are your rights, sorry about that typo, and the original creator's rights. Creative Commons is, is the place for OER. It's not the only openly licensed area, but it's, it's sort of like the beyond top one. There are other open licenses you can use, but I recommend going here. So 
I would recommend that everyone look at this website. There's a beautiful three minute video there to give you an overview of Creative Commons. And I highly recommend watching that. Um, last week, we talked about OER and its definition. And basically for something to be OER, you have to use the five R's. You have to be able to retain a copy and reuse it, revise it, remix it, and redistribute it to others. And so these open licenses kind of show you how those five R's play out. So I actually took this wonderful slide um, from Elizabeth Spica, and because she openly licensed her presentation, <laughs> I, I'm gonna show this slide to you. It was a CC BY. And um, you want to look for, you wanna look for things that are CC BY or are share alike, which means you need all, all Creative Commons license require attribution. You need to say, you need to give credit, of course. And so that's always gonna happen. But if it's share alike, that means you also need to create an open license. If it's non-commercial, it means you can, you can share it, but not for, not for money or not to anyone who might sell it. Uh, and, if you if you have no de non derivatives, the ND here means that you cannot create a copy and and send it out. So really, these are not OER. And I think her chart kind of beautifully shows that you want to kind of keep with. Oh, I'm sorry. The CC by or the share alike, or even for for our purposes in education, the non commercial is fine too. But when you when you get into the no derivatives you're getting away from OER. So you have to check out these licenses and see what you can and cannot do with the resource. And then once you know that you can use it, we're gonna start with adoption, the easy part. Um, you know, when we were looking at our examples, there are a variety of files and links available to anyone on the planet. I mean, it's just that easy. You're, you're gonna go in, you're gonna download a copy, you're gonna send it out and boom, everyone has it. Um, the format of the work depends on the platform of the authors, how they chose to share it. So we'll look at that a little. So in our open textbook library example, um, you know, we have all of these here. If you, if you click on those orange squares, you go here. So in this example of Stand Up and Speak Out, it is actually hosted. You could read it alive, uh, online because it's hosted by the University of Minnesota Libraries Publishing. Um, and so they have it on their platform and you can simply go there and read the book. You can also download the book in any of these formats. So um, Moby is Kindle, EPUB is what you would use to look at the an electronic device on a phone, you could do a digital PDF, a print PDF, uh, press books, which we may or may not talk more about today. Also, open document is like an open word document, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And if you scroll down, sorry, down here, you would just start seeing the chapters of the book on, on the platform. So it's, it's very easy to read. Um, you know, give, give your students a link and they're there. Um, the second book that we looked at on Open Textbook Library, or the second book on the list had some, some different options. So it's the same thing, they have different orange squares. And when you are to click on these, you go to somewhere totally different. And I just wanna kind of show that because you kind of have to get used to this with OER because these authors chose to host their work um, with the University System of Georgia Galileo site. So it's, it's in a different place. It's still hosted and you could still read, read the book, but you have to download it. And when you load their ebook, you kind of get this platform, but it's very easy. It took me seconds to get this book to read. But you also have the option of downloading a Word version. They don't seem to have an EPUB version. I think their third edition, their older edition is EPUB, but not their newer edition. So, you know, you could see all of your options there. Also, if you go down a little bit, um, the fourth edition, if this is below, so I pulled it up, includes a set of test banks, which are not available to the public. So if you can prove who you are to Dr. Barbara Tucker, 
at Dalton State, she could also give you even more. Um, so my point is that OER are wonderfully open. They are also maybe not so wonderfully and always slightly different. However, any OER should, be, should have an easily obtainable and shareable file so that you can distribute this to your students or to whoever needs it very easily. Um, so let's talk about adaptation and what can be changed. Uh, adapting, adapting a resource for specific course needs should, should always be possible. Again, you have to look at the licensing and make sure, but it, it should be possible and it should be fairly easy. So the steps we'll go through here is determine your license permission, permissions and consider the file types available and what kind of work expertise or knowledge that might that might take on your part. And also always have a redistribution plan in place before the work begins. It might be part of the license. If it's share alike, you may be required to do that. But also it's just good to have that in mind, like how am I gonna get this back out to my students or whoever might need this resource. Um, so again, going back to our example, if and um, I, I pointed this out earlier. So, um, so our first example had document. Our second example from the University of Georgia, it had a regular Word document. So both of these open up in Microsoft Word immediately, and you can just start typing, adding, doing whatever you want. And usually the easiest way to start adapting a textbook. Um, if you're simply gonna share this with your students, it, it's fairly easy to start making changes in a document turn it into a PDF, get it to your students. If you're going to share it out with others, um, that will take more steps. And if it's from the Open Education Network, it's 50 pages. Um, it gives you all kinds of useful information for getting your feet wet on what kind of file types and copyright considerations you will need, what you need to think about with tables, what you need to think about with images, um, what it takes to make an EPUB, what kind of HTML expertise would you need for certain things. It's, it's really an important, easy resource that I, I highly recommend. Okay, and so before our discussion, um, and I, I'm keeping this to 30 minutes, I'm proud. Um, let's just talk a little bit about OER creation. Which, which is scary. It's exciting. It's exciting. It's exciting, good and exciting, bad about about being innovative, because I still feel like in this area it's kind of the wild, wild west. Um, it sounds great to to create a resource, um, and I will I'll be the first to admit that I don't have I don't have personal experience creating an OER resource. It can be very simple about as far as creating slides or a module and share with your class. But if you wanna create a textbook, my understanding is that you can quickly fall into the deep end um, of needing to know how to use different types of software to format. And there is a lot involved because you're, you're basically self-publishing. Um, and I'm hoping that we can talk about this in our discussion because I know we have people uh, in our audience today who have created OER. But I wanted to give I wanted to give some um, recommendations for help. Um, these two tools websites that are worth exploring. The first is OER Commons. Uh, if you go to the OER Commons homepage, I couldn't get a link for this because it was embedded. But if you go to the OER homepage and scroll down, there is a whole five minute video on their open author tool. And as far as I can tell, this is a great starting point. Um, you have to author by sections. So I would probably want to compose and organize my work in a Word document and then move it into this tool personally. But it has accessibility tools to make sure that your work is accessible. And um, you, can, you can publish and then download what you create in this in, in a variety of formats and, and EPUB and PDF and Mobi and all kinds of things. So it's, it's pretty cool. It looks cool. Um, the next would be the Rebus community, um, and I wish Ryan was here. I know he's a big Rebus community user. Um, I, I'd like to know anybody off, but it's a big Rebus community user, but that is a good place to start and find publishing projects, 
looking for contributors, um, looking for a place to load your work. They have editing tools. And we also have editing tools through the open um, textbook library or open education network, I should say. But I didn't put a slide in there. But you can get you can get access to press books. I think through the Rebus community and and through um, through the open education network. But that software kind of has a learning curve and that would need to be its own conversation. Um, I think OER creation has to begin with a conversation. So if you're interested in creating OER, you know, of course, as part of this grant, we're going to be doing a call for proposal soon and, and hopefully, you know, we can find out what people are interested in. And hopefully that will help us to know what kind of support and infrastructure we need at MTSU to support our faculty and support OER. But, you know, talk to us. Um, Ryan Corstange has created a textbook for U1010 about that, has created OER resources. I'm going to talk about that in our um, kick off our discussion with some resources she's created. But there's never there's never a one size fits all do this, this and this. So it's something it's something we just need to talk through. But there are some guides for authoring open textbooks. If you want to get your feet wet and see what it would take, um, here are some ebooks, some open ebooks to look at. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I think I, and so I think that's it. And so now I'm hoping we can talk about um, your experiences with adoption, adaption, and creation, and your questions about that. Um, but here are some tools and resources. A lot of this came from uh, from Kim's um, D2L site. She can she can mention that later. So there's there's some resources there. There will be more resources on our um, our website coming soon. And I think that's it. Yeah, there are my references. So with that, I'm going to stop. Twenty nine minutes. Trying really hard not to go too long here. Um, and hopefully we can hear from you guys. What questions do you still have? What's working for you? What's not? Um, I'll let Kim start to kick that off. Sure. How is everybody? Yay. Uh, are you feeling uh, a little overwhelmed and also a little more direction as to where to get started um, on some OER? Uh, it's a big, massive topic and it is fairly all encompassing of just about anything that you can find out there that your students can get to um, for free. Um, so one of the things that I did want to mention, uh, she, she mentioned it briefly um, in the list of resources and things like that is um, you can get to our full list if you are logged into D2L uh, ever. Um, if you look at that top nav bar on your first homepage where the self-registration is, if you go in there and you go to the MTSU online certification, there's an entire module devoted to OER and it has links to a ton of repositories and information and things like that out there. So as we are still in the process of building the OER website, which is coming, um, as we're still building that, if you have questions or need something in the meantime, please feel free to go there uh, because it's got like all of them uh, that are in there. So especially if you go to the OER website and there's one that you like that's not there, feel free to send us a message, but, but know that if it's in the MTSU online when it's coming, we just haven't had a chance to put them all there yet. Um, one of the things that I like to cover a little bit when we're talking about adoption, adoption, uh, adoption, adapting, and creating, whoo y'all, um, is that it, it really is to the scale that you need it to be. So don't feel like that you have to create a textbook the very first time that you start dabbling into open educational resources. Don't feel like that your course has to be 100% OER the first time that you start putting things in that are resources. It's okay to start with one or two things and see how those one or two things go. It's okay to begin with a smaller scale of resources. It's okay to begin with 
um, instead of going out and, and creating a brand new book, go and find one that while technically wouldn't be considered completely open educational resource because it's not free to the whole world, if they're students at MTSU and it is a free resource through the library, then that is open to them um, because they have that access. So it's not necessarily worldwide OER, but the students do have access to it. So maybe look at a textbook that's already in the MTSU library and start there. Um, or work with Barnes and Noble, they have some uh, digital references that they can do through the library, I mean, through Barnes and Noble as well. Um, those are not typically completely OER because there's a fee, but it's still cheaper than buying a $700 textbook. Um, so that's just one of the things that I like to, to mention. Um, I am happy to show y'all a class that has a bunch of OER in it if you would like to see one or we can just kind of open up discussion about um, whatever questions that you have things that you want to know about things that you've run into in terms of OER um, the best thing to do with it is give it a shot just try practice something um, and we'll see what we do. there's a couple of requests so um, I will open up one of my classes for y'all so hang on just a second um, let me screen share for you. Okay, it should be big enough for y'all to see that. Uh, so this is one of my courses. Uh, my my OFM has been looking at this class. Um, so this is a course in a, a higher education doctorate program, um, and it is only using uh, resources that are free. Um, so uh, one or two of them are actually through the library, so they would not be considered 100% to the world OER, but they are free to students and students have access and they are open access through the library. So they have to be students to get to them, um, but that it's, they're not buying a textbook to get there. So, um, and I know y'all saw the thing the other day, that just went out from Sheila about gamification. If you look really, really close at the screen, this is one of the things that I'll talk about next week during the gamification thing. Does anybody see that right there? Like it just kind of moused over and it kind of lights up. It's white, so you can't really see it, but you'll see it become the, the cursor changes to the finger pointer. That's an Easter egg. Uh, so at some point, we'll talk about what virtual Easter eggs are in case you're excited, but since there was an example, I thought I'd show you. Um, so in this course, uh, the way that this course is set up for this whole program, uh, everything is done in the checklist. So there's only one item in each module. So it looks a little different from probably a lot of your courses where you put everything in there separately and individually. Um, but this one has everything is in the checklist. As you look through it, you'll see that um, right here we talk about the small teaching online. And what is small teaching online is a book. Well, that book has um, free access through the library. Um, it's an open book through the library. So the students can actually check that out through the MTSU library digitally. Um, and that makes it be a book that they don't have to go out and purchase and they have access to wherever they are. Um, then, hey, look, there's me smiling. Um, so this technically is an OER. So I know that's crazy because that really is just me and my face. Um, but that's me on a video that I created talking about learning theories and it is on YouTube and I allow my information to be Creative Commons. So technically this video is an open educational resource. Now I don't think anybody's going to go looking for it. I mean I know I'm cool but I don't think people go out and Google my videos just for fun every day. Um, but technically that makes it an OER because I created this content. I put it out there on YouTube and I put it out there as Creative Commons so anybody can use it if they would like it. Um, and then this book also is through the MTSU library. Um, so it is a, a free access through them for this book as well. Um, I then have a couple of TEDx videos in this one. Uh, and this is just the first module. So there's, there's lots of other things that happen within it as well. Um, this is actually Dr. Uh, Kevin Crambule's, his video from the LT and ITC. 
um, from when he did a presentation, it's where we're talking about backward design. So there's zero reason for me to go and create a video if there's one out there. Um, I don't need to recreate this information. If Kevin already did it and I can use it, then I'm gonna go ahead and use it. Um, so it it is that information. So that is me adopting. Um, that is me creating. There's not a lot of adaptation in mine because there wasn't a need um, within the resources that I was able to find, at least in this module. There, there's a couple of other places, um, but there's not, you don't have to adapt if what is there is already right along lines of what you need. Or if you can use something that already exists and then kind of add a little bit to it in terms of um, additional, an additional little video or um, a little text that you would put in there to talk about the information. Um, you don't have to start from scratch every time. You really can take something and just kind of expound on it. So a lot of what it is and a lot of why um, some people feel kind of overwhelmed with OER is that you feel like you have to create everything on your own and you really don't. That's where you got to think about that adopt and adapt. What is already out there? Um, these people are experts in their field just as you are an expert in your field. What is it that they're talking about that you can use their information and bring it in? And that not only gives you the opportunity to not have to create a million videos or resources, which is super nice, um, but it also gives your students the opportunity to hear and see things from different perspectives. Uh, and that in itself is also really helpful in terms of the embracing equity and the inclusivity that's super important in uh, utilization of OERs is that the more individuals that we use or the more resources that we use or the more information that we can get through OER, the greater level of diversity we have through our presenters, through their perspective of how to do things or how they see things. Um, so that's just one example of a course. So I can, at some point, if y'all want to, I can show you some more, but I, I could sit here all day and show you all my classes. But um, I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what some of those things can look like and what ad adopting and adapting and creating can look like within your course. And it doesn't have to be super huge if you're willing to record something and put it out there on YouTube and create a comment and put it in the public domain, then you've just done it. You created an OER. You didn't have to do a full textbook. You could do a five minute video. Um, so just kind of thinking about that. What kind of questions does everybody have about OER or my class? If it's my class, we should probably chat later, but. <laughs> Oh yeah, Aaron? a question. Yeah, yeah go yeah. ahead. Um, so uh, I guess for things that you're already using in classes, um, some of the other sources I know I've pulled are demo videos and things like that from YouTube to demonstrate different art techniques. Um, how do I go back to some of those videos in, in YouTube? How do I find where the licensing is if there's licensing? Um, because I, I know I've pulled like a variety of things to show them in class. Um, I don't know if you guys have any <laughs> advice on that. that that's, As you go back. Yeah, I, I have some advice. Mary Ellen may want to. I, I noticed at the last meeting, somebody um, or last webinar, someone said at my last place, we had a copyright librarian. <laughs> we don't we don't have a um, we don't have a copyright librarian, um, mm -hmm. but it's copyright, it's like statistics, you can never know enough. And as library, we're, we're always learning more about copyright. But uh, again, I want to, I want to point out that Creative Commons video, it, that's three minutes and do the example at the, the beginning of that, like, in this country, we have copyright protections, if you write an idea on a napkin, it is protected by copyright. So if it's not openly licensed, it is protected by copyright. And um, a lot of people aren't bothered by that, are bothered by that in YouTube, but I guess and I, I, so I know I'm different, but like my hands are super tied as a librarian, as the acquisitions librarian who loves to buy content for everybody. I, I can't do it. Um, so basically, if if it's not openly licensed, then it's traditional copyright and you should get permission to use it. Um, I know that doesn't that doesn't happen a lot, honestly. <laughs> But that's that's where I stand um, as a librarian. And, and as far as getting material for people, if I can't buy it as a multi-user textbook, then 
get our as a multi user ebook for students. We're out of luck. And like through the pandemic, we're like, can't you scan it? And they're like, yeah, if I go ask the author and get permission, which we do, especially during the pandemic. But yeah, so that's sadly my advice. And well, I guess too, I'm just wondering, like, as you're looking at where is that on YouTube? Where do the, the authors of the videos, where do they post that? Um, do they put it in the more information section or where do they oh, you mean if that it's, like? Oh, if it has a Creative Commons yeah. license? Oh, yeah, okay. Where, where oh, that's interesting. That? Okay. Yeah. And again, yeah. uh, on the website. Sorry, I this, didn't clarify. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, and I'm, I'm not the best at this. It's, and I don't know if Denise is here, but anyway. Um, okay, so there are three levels for Creative Commons. Um, copyright and part of that is the machine level so there is a bit of code that you can put into the html so that it will find it through crawlers and it and it will um it makes it more visible to people but normally you see the gray box that um i had on one of my slides i could pull up but look for those gray boxes um I, like you'll notice anything if you're even doing a PowerPoint presentation or in a spreadsheet and you want to pull in from Microsoft Word, pull in an image. If it says CC by, a lot of times down below the images, those are Creative Commons. You, you'll you'll find that on YouTube videos. I can't think of any special place to look. It should be there by the author. And a lot of times, if if people have been thoughtful enough to put a Creative Commons license on it, they'll slap one of those gray boxes on there to let you know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. What other questions does anybody have? Or what are you doing with OER? We'd love to know. Mm -hmm. I had a question um, about longevity. I, I uh, put it in the chat, but oh, I'm sorry. Um, are, are OER sources, what can we expect in terms of how long they'll be available? And, you know, do they just drop out of sight or what's that? Uh, no, I think it, de it depends on how you choose to publish it and, and where it's hosted. Um, I mean, if, if you decide that you're not really going to publish it and put it out there for the world on a platform such as OER Commons or um, the Open Textbook Library, then it's probably going to, you know, languish in D2L. But if you, okay, so if you publish it, it's going to be there uh, for a, a life of file as long as OER Commons shall last. The problem is if you don't update it all, you know, update it and renew it over time, it's going to be, you know, uh, outdated flotsam on the web. Yeah, so I, I guess what I meant was, if I use somebody else's work, can I okay. count on it being there? Yes. Um, no. I, well, yes and no. It really yeah, does well, absolutely totally depend on what it is, because at any point somebody can take their information down. And so that's, that's that's where you're, you know, if it's a, if it's a textbook, if it's an OER textbook, it's probably out there and it's out there from now until forever. Uh, if it's somebody's YouTube video, they might take it down tomorrow. Um, so that's the, that's the only thing to be aware of with some of that stuff. Is there any workaround with that, Kim, uh, in terms of technology? Can we download, can we preserve those files for our cells for like next semester or something? As long yeah. as it is one that is um, a Creative common mm -hmm. situation, then yes, you can. Um, if it's not, then the standard YouTube license requires that you cannot change it. And then you simply have to link it into YouTube. And because then it's, it's playing in YouTube. You didn't take it, it's playing in YouTube. Um, so uh, if it has a standard YouTube license, then you're kind of you're, you're going with that. Now, in reality, most people don't go back in and take their stuff down once it's in there, so you're probably safe. Um, but yes, if it has the Creative Commons, you can download that information and save it. Um, and then you can also, uh, you'd be able to like put it into Panopto or within your own um, 
Camtasia or Screencast Fire, anything that you have, and you can at that point also easily adapt it if it's got the full CC on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And and you can always, for textbooks, get your own copy. But in reality, you're you're going to want to. If I were adopting a textbook, get it from a repository that I trusted, so that you could you could keep pointing your students, and they can choose the format that works best for them. Um, and I think the repositories we've listed, you you can count on that. Notice I didn't list Merlot, even though it's a it's a good OER spot. But it, uh, you know, Merlot kind of bugs me because I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of dead stuff out there. But yeah, uh, Merlot has been around for a long, long time. So has their stuff. <laughs> so um, they're not necessarily the the number one to go to, um, and it also kind of depends on what your area of emphasis is, whether or not one is better than the other. So you may find that some are much better based on what you're looking for than others. Um, but I'm with you on Merlot. It's not my favorite. I'm the, I'm mom. I love mom. The George Mason Metafinder. That's it's mom. That's its acronym, Mason OER Metafinder. Um, it's my favorite, so everybody yeah, has I, one, I feel like. Yeah, and my, and my favorite, one reason my favorite is open textbook network is because they're trying so hard to build an infrastructure that will last. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I love OpenStax. OpenStax is amazing, and but they have a lot of money and a lot of care, and I think those are platforms you could depend on. Mm -hmm. They're in this for the long haul. There's some great resources that people have been loading up into the chat. So make sure that y'all check some of those out and we'll we'll pull them and we'll add them in the information that we send out from the LT and ITC um, as well so that y'all all have them in one place. Um, and yes, Janet, government information goes down all the time. Um, anytime there's a change in any administration or a shutdown or I don't know, Snowmageddon. The GPO or wasn't ICE. funded. Yeah, yeah I mean, the GPO's like, not funded. And then, well, yeah. Yeah, so government sites go down a lot. So do know that they probably are some of the least stable yeah. um, in terms of resources remaining intact as they are. I have a question on that exact thing. I use a lot of state of Tennessee uh, education policy documents. And you're right, 30 days later, they are gone or been moved. Since that's not copyrighted material, can I just download the document and just continue to use the document rather than have a link? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, it's state, I mean, it's a state policy, so it has that, to be that, freely available. So okay. yeah, okay. you can that's just download it. That's what I currently do. I just, see now I have on, on if, if I go to jail, you have to go with me. <laughs> that's right, because it's recording. So now there it's there. <laughs> ah. Now the government, <laughs> particularly state government on policy stuff it's there one day and it drives you nuts because I like to use that in some of my classes and that's the only solution I have found that's stable is put the pdf or whatever it is in the course itself you can uh, probably go to wherever the landing page is that the the policy comes from because they may change the policy but they probably aren't changing the landing no, page that then the lists. administration changes all of that changed too yeah that's true yeah, it, it was a mess. It really was a mess. And I didn't know it until the class started. Anyway. Right. Then you just give your student extra credit for finding a link that didn't work. It was on purpose. <laughs> I was checking to see if y'all were looking. Yeah. Here's your four, one credit. Twenty three of point. them in that particular course. Yeah. yeah that's all of them went away. And yeah. now y'all also know how I deal with when a link dies in the middle of class. When the student tells me, oh, congratulations, you found it first. Here's your extra credit point. An Easter um, egg, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but I guess, too, it's not for state, but I also want to give a shout out to Hein Online, which is a library resource. Um, I have a hard time calling library resources OER because we pay so much for them. But uh, <laughs> that that's what we want you guys to use. And it has it uh, is a low cost resource, but they do a lot of indexing of government data that's and law that's super useful so if you haven't looked at that one it's worth it i think if y'all are looking for something in particular i i would encourage you to reach out to the people in the library because they're awesome uh, and they will help you find things and they will help things just appear in your life which is beautiful uh, so don't forget that they're a resource and that you don't have to do it all on your own 
Yes. Uh, there are people here that will help you. So, um, and so I think uh, I just, just to share, um, you know, like one reason librarians get so involved in OER and we love it so much is because that's what we do. Information should be available to everyone. That's why libraries started to purchase books and make them available to the community. And now in the age of information overload, we're getting to the point where we, we can't even buy resources anymore. We can only lease them from publishers. We, we cannot own things anymore. And we see that with textbooks and we see how it's hurting students. And in the age of information overload, we've kind of pivoted with that with student success to like, oh, let's make sure we're matching the curriculum. And in, you know, in the bygone years when I started my career, we didn't buy textbooks, but now we do. And we have the library textbook program um, that honestly got started because we couldn't get OER funded uh, when we wanted. So we did that instead. But it's something that's near and dear to our hearts. I would like to say that we have like so many other libraries do, publishing support, uh, you know, a publishing operation. And if you were interested in adapting and creating OER that we could work you in, but we don't have that kind of infrastructure set up. But one thing we want to learn from this grant is what kind of infrastructure we need. So although I, I don't think I have all the expertise to be your Sherpa through this process, and I, I don't have the time either because we're all doing this on top of our jobs, we want to hear from you. So if you don't want to pour out your heart here and you have project specifics you want to talk about, please contact me and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Absolutely. Any other questions, comments, ways that you're using OER that you'd like to share? I use the Internet Archive a lot. I don't know if anybody else uses it, but there's all those like old games from the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, when computers first started happening, like Oregon Trail and Number Munchers. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I use things like that a lot too, is that I, I will sometimes find things that are ways that you can connect with your students and they can go out and do something fun and engaging um, and bring it in to your class. And I'm, I'm not going to make people go out and buy Oregon Trail. I don't even know if you can um, buy okay. Oregon Trail, but they can use it right there and they can go and try not to die of dysentery um, or a snake bite <laughs> or ford a river or whatever. Um, so there's, you know, it's just allowing, OER kind of allows you to be really creative with some of the resources that you can bring into your class. So you, you have so many options um, in a class to be able to use them. Have fun with it. Okay. Maybe, uh, I guess if anyone has anything else to share, please shout out. But I guess I'll wrap us up. This will be on the LT and ITC YouTube channel. Um, you know, and I think just we need to work on getting this openly licensed. We need to practice what we preach and make sure that gets on there. But um, will be. <laughs> um, yeah. And the next one, speaking of using things in your classroom, I, maybe around March 9th or 10th, somewhere in there, but there will be an announcement. What you do with this stuff? How would you design a class with OER? Which Kim has talked about some, but they'll be talking about that more. Awesome. Okay. Thank y'all. Yeah, thank you. Thank y'all.